abide by your observances, Father, in our lives. Father, we're here today to take a communion, Father, to do this remember of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, who bled and died and rose from the grave for us. Father, we want to look at Scripture and see how it's supposed to really be because we want to honor you with all we do in your ordinances, Father, <coughs> as your word tells us. So, Father, steal my heart that I may hear your voice, O Lord, as I deliver your words. And may they be on the ears, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Beautiful song. And I, I want to tell you the Lord is here with us today. Amen. He's here. He'll always be here. That's one of the beauties of, of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They will reside with us. They want to walk alongside and guide us in our thought process and everything that we do. Today we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. And I always take great caution with the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper because I never want it to become ritualistic with us. Amen. I want to truly understand the depth of what this really means. So I'm prepared. Some of you have already been through this process, but I seem like I turn it around a little bit more and more each time uh, with more scripture, thank goodness, and uh, to help us understand. The Lord's Supper is a time of reflection. I want to take a look at three things to reflect on. We have the past to reflect on, the present to reflect on, and the future. I want us to look back by observing what Christ has done in our past relationship with Christ. On the evening He was betrayed, Jesus was eating a meal with His disciples. We call this the upper room discourse. He took some bread and He said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When we join in with the Lord's Supper, we will eat a piece of bread or a cracker in remembrance of Christ because His body was broken on our behalf. Therefore, we should reflect back, being thankful. Jesus of loving gave Himself for us so He could suffer the cost of our sin. Jesus continued on and said, in the same way after supper, He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. See, when we drink a small amount of wine or grape juice here at the Lord's Supper, remember that Jesus' blood was shed for us and that His blood was the sign of the new covenant. The shedding of blood for forgiveness of sin. The shedding of blood for forgiveness of our sin. Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice that can cleanse us. The sprinkling of animal blood sealed the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, but it was unable to clean, cleanse the conscience of sin. See, the precious blood of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus, ushered in a new covenant and is able to cleanse, hear this, our conscience once and for all. Take a look at this in Hebrews. I want you to read along and follow along as I read God's Word to explain this. It's rather lengthy, but that's okay. It's Scripture. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 1 through 28. The earthly place, we'll see that in verses 1 through 10. The first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room, there was a lampstand, a table, and sacred loaves of bread on the table. The room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was a second room called the most holy place. And in that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all, both sides. You ever want to know what's in the Ark of the Covenant? Here it is. Inside the Ark were a gold jar containing manna. There was Aaron's staff that had sprouted leaves and the stone tablets of the covenant were inside the Ark. Above the ark were two angels, where the angels are cherubims of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. When these things were in all place, the earthly priests, earthly priests, regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins. And then for the sins of the people, it was committed in ignorance. You see, if you knew you sinned, you're supposed to confess that. But these were the ones that were committed in ignorance. 
I've got a feeling I've got a long list of those things committed to ignorance. But I want to tell you what, that whole list is covered with the blood of Christ and it's washed away. White as snow. That's hard to imagine. Isn't it? You're white as snow. You're cleansed with the blood of the Lamb. Not by an earthly priest or an animal sacrifice, but God Himself on the cross cleansed you, the Lamb of God. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely opened as long as the Old Testament tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration. Here we go. Pointing to the present time for the gifts and sacrifices that the earthly priests offer are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. And that better system showed up. The God-man. In verse 11, we start to see the redemption to the blood of Christ. We see the system changing now, becoming pure. The final sacrifice, the Lamb of God. So Christ has now come, the high priest over all good things that have come. Listen to this. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world, with His own blood, not the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption. How long? Forever. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, it says in Ephesians. You confess your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and believe in Him and put your faith in Him. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. He holds your salvation. And He alone holds that. It cannot be taken back from you. It is a gift. You are sealed. Do you know how many people go around thinking they can lose their salvation? If you're one of those, please stop. You didn't earn it. It's a free gift. You accepted Christ as your Savior. Don't add anything to the cross, please. Don't think you have to do something in order to be saved in addition to faith in Christ. Please don't do that. Don't, don't, don't hurt the precious blood of Christ in His beauty by thinking that we have to do something to be okay. Until you verse 14. Just think of how much more. Here we are. You read up in the other part of verse 9 that the offering of the priests are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. But now in verse 14, look at this. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. How's your conscience? Is there shame and guilt? Did you get to hear precious Heather? She's getting free. She's getting out of bondage. We all get out of bondage when we start to understand that when we follow the Holy Spirit, it says in Corinthians, there is liberty in the Spirit. And there's a freedom that's there. Just think of how much more the blood of Christ will purify our conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of eternal Holy Spirit, Christ offered Himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why Christ, our eternal high priest, is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sins that they had committed under even the first covenant. Verse 23, skipping down a little bit. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of the things in heaven, had to be purified with animal blood. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. For Christ did not enter into the holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. You see that picture? When Christ came down and took away your sins, took away my sins, died on the cross and raised from the grave. He then entered into heaven's gates and presented us to the Father and says, Father, they're clean now because of what you've initiated and what I've done. They are clean. 
and God's mercy says, you'll be judged as my son. You are pure and righteous and holy. And I've got a place prepared for you. I've taken away the sting of death. Death no longer has a victory because now there's a victory in Christ. You just pass on to be with the Lord. That's what happens. We've overcome death through Jesus Christ. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. Wow. I can't think of a better person to speak for me on my behalf other than Jesus Christ. Man, don't you know there was a rejoicing in heaven when they got together? He had his son back. Back where he was belonged. And now he had brought a whole train of saved people with him. He had done what the Father had sent him to do. He became a propitiation of our sins, the remover of the wrath of God. Then the final sacrifice for all who believe. Here we go. Verse 25. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again and ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ died once for all as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again not to deal with our sins. Did you hear that? He will come again not to deal with your sins. Everybody afraid of the great judgment? Don't be. He did. That's been taken care of. Your sins have been paid for. He's coming again to rejoice with you. You're His children. So when Christ died once for all as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people, He will come again not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are, we, who are eagerly waiting for Him. What a beautiful thing. Amen. It's called the Bema Seat. <clears throat> Christ comes. It's called the Bema Seat. We'll talk about that one day later on. You read in Corinthians where though people walk in and the works maybe are burned up, but they're still in heaven. He will take a look and see. It's not a simple thing. Look and see the things you've done for Him. But it'll be a rejoicing time. I'll cover that sometime so we can see that. It's called the gifts of heaven that we have while we're here on earth. See, there is rewards for what we do. But it's why we do it that the reward is there. We do it for Christ. So many times we don't know what we're doing. Different sermon. So when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we do so because we have been cleansed by the Lamb of God, and our conscience is clean because of His sacrifice as a purifying love. So when we partake in the Lord's Supper, we should look back to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Here's a question for you. Is Jesus' death a good thing or a bad thing to reflect back on? Did you ever think of that? Is it a good thing or a bad thing to look back on? When we're given a gift of great, gift of great value, a gift that involves personal sacrifice for us, how should we receive this? With mourning or regret? Absolutely not. That is not what the giver wants us to have. Rather, we should receive it with great gratitude as an expression of great love. If we have tears, they should be tears of joy. So the Lord's Supper, although a memorial of a death, is not a funeral that Jesus was still dead. It's just the opposite. We deserve the ordinance by knowing that death cannot hold Jesus, nor can death hold you because of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a tremendous gift to us. It's precious. It's the gift. Hear this. It's the gift of eternal life. Wow. Now what do you say after that? What a gift. Most precious gift you can ever receive in your life. Amen. And it's so sad that people think they don't work for it. See, Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Sin left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. You see, we rejoice that Jesus conquered death and has set us free, all who were enslaved by the fear of death. Let me read one or two more verses in Hebrews. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Because God's children, of course, are human beings made of flesh and blood, Jesus Christ, the Son, also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could He die, and only by dying could He break the power of the Satan who had the power of death. 
Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. How would you be afraid of passing away? Don't be afraid of dying. The fear of dying is gone. He set us free. You've got to go be with Him. And those of you that have lost your loved ones, they're with Him. They're safe. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more tears. There's still tears here because we do miss them. And I have no way to understand how badly you do miss them. But if we will look to Christ and talk to Him about our precious ones, thank Him that He's got a place for them and keeping them. Maybe it can relieve some of our pain. I hope so. It's a difficult thing to lose a loved one. See, we can remember Jesus' death joyfully because He has been victorious over sin and death. The Israelites look back to the Passover as the identifying moment in their history when they identified and their nation began. This is how they escaped death and slavery through the powerful hand of God were freed to serve the Lord. In the church, we look back to the events surrounding the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ as the defining moment in our history. This is how we escape the grip of death and the slavery of sin. And now we're freed to serve the Lord. You see, the Lord's Supper is our memorial of this defining moment in our history. That's what we're observing. Coming to the Lord's table in the past, looking at the past, and having communion should be a celebration. It's not a funeral. The Lord's Supper has us reflect not only on our past, but, number two, we reflect on our present relationship with Jesus Christ. Now we look at the present relationship. The Apostle Paul addresses this within the church of Corinthians. He says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread we break a participation in the body of Christ? Absolutely it is. In the Lord's Supper, we show that we share in Jesus Christ. We commune with Him, and we are united with Him. The New Testament speaks of our sharing in several ways. First, we share in His crucifixion. Look at Galatians 2.19. We're going to get there pretty quick next Sunday. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law, and I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self... Y'all know this first, don't you? Has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Another way we unite with Him in His death. Romans 6, 3, 5. Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined Him in His death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives since we have been united with Him in His death. Number three, we share as we are raised in His resurrection. Thank goodness. <coughs> therefore, Colossians 3, 1 through 3, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things here on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's a pretty safe resting place right there. In Romans 6, 5, the last part, we will also be raised to life as He was. We also share as we live life with Christ. For it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. See, our lives are in Him, and He is in us. The Lord's Supper symbolizes this spiritual reality. Let me make a point here. Year by year, as we grow in spiritual maturity, we surrender or release more of our person to our Savior. In a sense, we offer Him more control of our life. That's how we mature. God's Word divides in our heart the things that we shouldn't do, the things that we shouldn't do. And we give more and more to Him as we mature. It's a gradual process. Eventually, we invite Jesus into the closet of our heart where our worst sins are hidden. Guess what? He cleanses us too. 
not a spot in you that you have to cleanse if you've accepted Christ as your Savior. It is a process, and the Lord's Supper plays a role in this process. To see, a man ought to examine himself before he partakes or eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. You see, every time we participate, we should be mindful of the great meaning involved in the ordinance. Now we can just talk about that just for a second. When we examine ourselves many times, what do we find? We always find that sin, don't we? <laughs> you just go right to it, don't we? It's normal. I want to tell you, it's not a reason to avoid the Lord's Supper. It's simply a reminder that we need Christ in our lives and only He can take away our sins. So the Lord's Supper, seeing our participation in Christ is seen, also is seen in our participation with one another. Paul writes in Corinthians again, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are all also one body. You see, by participating together in the Lord's Supper, we picture the fact that we are one body in Christ, one with each other, with responsibilities towards one another. This is a beautiful body of Christ. This little precious. I hate to even say the word church because church is people, not building. I, I, I see so much love amongst you to one another, so much help and support. It absolutely gives me encouragement beyond belief. Y'all are some of the most loving people I've ever been around. You're kind to me. You're kind to my precious wife. Someone will say, well, isn't that the way it is? No. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but it is the way it is here. So, Amen. It is the way it is here, and I appreciate that. Finally, we look at the past and we look at the present. This will be quick. The Lord's Supper also reminds us, and this is the part I love, about the future return of Christ. He said, Jesus said He would not drink of the fruit of the vine until He came into the fullness of the kingdom. Matthew 26. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, He broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is My body. And when He had taken the cup and given thanks, then He said to them, as we look at Mark now, This is My blood which confirms the covenant between God and His people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth. Look at this. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And they sang to him and went out to the Mount of Olives. You see, when we participate, we're reminded that Jesus has provided his promise. There will be a great messianic banquet, a wedding supper, and a celebration. We will all be attending. And Christ will be serving. We won't have a symbol. We will have the real deal. What a banquet that's going to be. What a banquet that's going to be. Something to look forward to. Something to be encouraging. If you've got sin, just confess it. But this is a celebration of what's going to be coming in the future when we get to have a supper with the Lamb Himself face to face. Wow. Can you imagine Jesus serving you? What a beautiful thing. Until then, let's serve him. Until then, let's serve him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your beautiful words, your scriptures, Father, that just cleanse our heart. Father, thank you that we'll be partaking in the Lord's Supper. Father, we do this in remembrance of you. Father, thank you for this beautiful body of believers that you purchased with your blood. Father, thank you for the beautiful privilege of loving them and serving them, Father. Father, may we walk with you in a way, Father, that you get to experience a beauty of your Son, Jesus Christ, being present as we walk, that others may see him. For us in Christ's name I pray. Amen.